welcome to this lecture. To tell you a bit about myself, my name is Simi Mehta and I am joining you from New Delhi, India. I am an optimist and a strong advocate of peaceful coexistence between human beings, communities and nations. My academic training is in political science and international relations and I hold a PhD in American studies from the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. I serve IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, as its CEO and Editorial Director. I am also a humble recipient of the Fulbright Nehru Fellowship and was affiliated to the Ohio State University, USA. My areas of research include US's and India's agriculture and foreign policies, international security studies, sustainable development, climate change, gender justice, urban environment and food security. Previously, I have had the opportunity to participate in ULAB's international webinar series on protecting diversity, tolerance and pluralism amid COVID-19 as a panelist for the session on role of youth in promoting diversity, tolerance and pluralism. Today, I would be taking you through the concepts of nationality, racism and citizenship. The concept of ideal society in terms of racial justice and how racial profiling can spread inter interracial tensions in a society. Nationality, racism and citizenship in the prevailing times is extremely important. Racial profiling in societies across the world can spread interracial tensions and it is only through the conceptualization and implementation of racial justice that leads to the realization of an ideal society. There is actually a very complex relationship between nationality, race and also citizenship and they yield to several ramifications like crises of development. And this is a feature which is common across all societies and nations of the world. So what is nationalism? Nationalism can be seen as a complex relationship and like most such relationships, people have to work hard to strive a balance uh, between the tensions of self and others. While many nations have succeeded in using this nationalism to develop, this same sense of nationalism has also generated various forms of exclusivism and competition that make it hard to resolve the shared global problems. While some see the rise of nationalism or tribalism as a sign of the end of the world, there is actually a form of self-interest that has increased the growth. Uh, for instance, we take the example of China. The growth was driven in the populous nation state of China, which was enabled by powerful nationalist movements, especially revolutionary nationalism, premised on a more equitable contract with the population than the older imperialist order. Development, in other words, was encouraged by the inclusive nationalism that grew out of redistributive justice and economic and political failures of the system and the rise of the new classes that demanded change. I would like to point out to two forms of nationalism, mostly related to European nationalism. The earliest form of nationalism in Europe was closely linked to imperialism and the twin forces of economic development and exclusion, which continued well into the 20th century. As Eric Hobsbawm has pointed out, imperial expansion was justified by a nationalism that was more racist than rational. Hannah Arendt points out that imperialists were able to harness the nationalism because they claimed to supersede the reality of internal national divisiveness and they represented the glory of the nation. Through the world wars and on to the post-war peace, this glory has expressed itself in both hate and inclusion. Scholars often distinguish between two types of nationalism. First, an ethnic variety which is built on race, religion and language uh, versus a civic nationalism which is the second type of nationalism in which rights are granted to all citizens regardless of their race, ethnicity, language, religion or culture. German nationalism is, for example, often condemned as ethnic and exclusive, whereas the Anglo-French nationalism is seen to be more civic and inclusive. Nationalism in Europe and Asia has had many faces. For example, revolutionary, it has been top-down, it has been anti-communist, 
It has been participatory, civic, ethnic, and also religious. The immediate post-war decades also saw a large inclusive civic model across much of the globe, permitting new nation states to develop capabilities as they became independent, and also to in ensure that they have an expansion of their resources without strong ethnocentric biases. The prevalence of the post-war inclusive model has had much to do with the geopolitical circumstances of the victory of the Allied forces in the Second World War, but it was also enabled by strong anti-imperialist national movements, as was the case in India. There were also movements for the reduction of inequality and social injustice. And more recently, the relationship between the national political movements and economic development has taken a more sinister turn, exposing the tension between self and the other that lies at the heart of all forms of nationalism. The global ascendance of the neoliberal capitalism has been accompanied by the rise of chauvinistic and populistic nationalism. We come to the concept of racism. Race is a very powerful idea and an enduring concept which has been invented by society. This definition is advanced by the American Anthropological Association which goes on to state that racism has fostered inequality and discrimination for centuries as well as influencing how we relate to other human beings. Racism is actually a systematized form of oppression which is developed by members of one race in order to persecute members of the other race. Racism is the belief that characteristics and abilities can be attributed to people simply on the basis of their race and that some racial groups are superior to others. Racism and discrimination have been used as powerful weapons, encouraging fear or hatred of others in times of conflict and war and even during economic downturns. For example, from the institutionalized racism, especially in colonial times when racial beliefs, even eugenics, were considered something were not considered something wrong, to recent times where the effects of neo-Nazism is still felt, primarily in Europe. It is a complex area with many cultures in a relatively small area of land that has seen many conflicts throughout history. Second, it was the purported white man's burden with which the Britishers came to India and colonized it subsequently on the garb of the superior race to civilize an inferior race of those people living in the Indian subcontinent. Thirdly, for over thousands of years in India, there has been a discrimination against the lowest caste in Hinduism, the Dalits or the formerly untouchable communities. Although it has been outlawed by the Indian constitution, the caste system was a way to structure inequality into the system itself. And while being outlawed, the social barriers it has created is still prevalent in the country. Uh, it also features in the views of Hindu extremists and traditionalists whose prejudices lead to sectarian and also religious violence. Uh, next example is the United States, where racism is a well-known issue. It is infamous actually for the history of slavery, issues like racial profiling, to police brutality against the minorities, and also rising resentment against the immigrants. Uh, slavery was formerly you know, was formally made illegal uh, after a long drawn battle called the Civil War in 1865. But despite this, the white supremacists and the hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan continue to exist and have prejudices against the blacks and Native Indian Americans from them mixing or even socializing in the public spaces. The recent brutal killing of Mr. George Floyd a black man by a white policeman in the May of 2020 is a glaring example of the prevalent racism in the so-called progressive America. This shook the social movements across the United States and also in different parts of the world in the name of Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. And these sought to draw the world attention to the discriminations and the violation of fundamental and human rights of the people. According to A. Shivanandan, the increasing xenophobic culture of uh, globalization 
in it can be seen in uh, various parts of the world and this is actually an instrument of discrimination and a tool of exploitation but it manifests itself as a cultural phenomenon susceptible to cultural solutions such as multicultural education and promotion of ethnic identities uh, tackling the problem of cultural inequality however does not by itself redress the problem of economic inequality racism is actually conditioned by economic imperatives but negotiated through culture like religion literature art language uh, sciences and also the media so essentially racism has been engendered in various ways uh, once the blacks were demonized to justify slavery then the colored the colored people were demonized to justify colonialism and today the asylum seekers are demonized to justify the ways of globalism and in the age of media demonization actually sets out the parameters of popular culture within which our within which the such exclusion finds its own rationale uh, usually under the guise of guise of xenophobia and the fear of uh, strangers so uh, with these issues and concerns of narrow nationalism and racism what is an ideal society i propose an ideal society where there is racial justice racial justice it is clear is the absence or at least to some extent of racial justice but then how should we understand racial justice racial justice is a part of justice and because it is a part of justice it clearly falls within the domain of morality i subscribe to kurt byer's thoughts that racial justice falls under the sub domain of morality that is social justice according to two very noted scholars matthew desmond and mustafa emir byer in a racially just society the gap between the rich and the poor would narrow as would the income and wealth disparities across the race according to manning marable racial justice cannot be achieved without a broader and more radical social transformation according to amy goodman her moral moral conception of racial justice starts from the premise that all human beings regardless of their color should be treated as free and equal beings worthy of the same set of basic liberties similarly in ronald dworkin's moral reading of the american constitution the abstract moral principle of racial justice to which the equal protection clause gives expression is a larger group sensitive recognition of equal status and equal concern for all races um, now to discuss racism racial discrimination xenophobia and even related intolerance a global a un global conference was held and of course many uh, nation states participated while it was actually a brave uh, effort by the united nations to attempt to hold such a meeting it proved to be a heated challenge while all nations are being are good at being critical at others critical of others when it comes to their own criticisms most would be uncomfortable to say the least as an example uh, it's it witnessed what was witnessed was united states and europe were against the effective discussions of slavery reparations and that is why they had actually sent in only a few low level delegates and it was possibly a sign of how they really felt about this conference uh, secondly israel and united states were against discussing the possibility that zionism is racist against palestinians and uh, it caused both to walk out of the conference altogether and india was uh, against including discussions again about uh, caste based discrimination and some arab nations were against discussions on oppressions of kurds or arab slave trade and and the story continued so a watered down declaration was eventually made which actually did not yield to anything much or substantial therefore to summarize now on the one hand nationalism today works to protect against real or perceived predation and on the other hand it seeks to integrate the nation for competitive advantage further while economic globalization has made the world more in, uh, more uh, interdependent um, nationalism has made it difficult to translate this interdependence into cooperation 
especially for problems such as planetary environmental crises. Further, the fanatic nationalism is leading to racism, which then leads to racial discrimination and hence to racial disparities in terms of unequal economic development. Such differences, imposed or otherwise, is being manifested through interracial tensions and chaos in the societies, and it also leads to prejudices and stereotypes. Hence, racial justice needs to be ensured, and only then would each person, regardless of her or his color, place of birth and origin, and of residence, would be an equal citizen in the truest sense of the term. With this, I end my lecture. So as the next steps, those watching this video must go through the additional resources that I have recommended and also do keep an eye on the multilateral and international conferences that are being organized around the themes of nationalism and racial justice. Any debates contributing to the theme would also act as relevant updates and these would together help bring an in-depth understanding of the challenges and also provide ideas as the way forward towards creating a peaceful world order. So with this hope, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any doubts, queries or questions, feel free to reach out to me at simi at impreindia.org. Thank you so much. And finally, I have uh, put forward a set of 10 questions for you to attempt based on the lecture and also on the additional readings that I have recommended. So go ahead and attempt those. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.